and so Hello everyone and welcome to module 10. In module 10 we'll talk about non-experimental research design. So uh, I'll break this up the same way that your book does and talk about survey research, correlational research, causal comparative research, and evaluation research. Um, and we'll go through each of those topics uh, covering some of the material in the book and then a little bit um, additional uh, material. So your book does a nice job of giving a sense of why we use surveys. Uh, one of the main reasons is that they're often inexpensive and so they're a great way to conduct research if you are on a budget, which um, most of you, if you're thinking about going on and doing a PhD and doing a dissertation, mm -hmm. will be a big consideration for you um, and is a big consideration for most researchers. Uh, these are typically fairly quick to create, administer, clean, and analyze. They can take a bit longer, certainly, especially if you want to make sure that your survey is constructed really well. Um, I recently put together a survey, and uh, my colleague and I did qualitative interviews and ethnography as a way of informing what we would ask and how we would ask it. And we also sent drafts of the survey to a variety of people to get their feedback on. And so it took us a year to put together this particular survey. Um, so they can be pretty quick if you know exactly what you want to get uh, for this project. We wanted to, to really have a well-informed survey and, and put together something that was um, acceptable to the community. And so they can take longer depending on uh, what kind of work you need to put into them. Uh, they have a lot of potential for confidentiality or even for anonymity. You can often get large samples. Uh, for this particular survey, we now have close to 1,400 responses, uh, which is amazing. It's been up since April. Um, so you can often get much larger samples than you can using more labor-intensive research methodologies. You can often cover a range of topics pretty easily and quickly. Uh, they can be used for a whole range of purposes in different kinds of research. Um, and so surveys may not get in-depth data, cater to a wide range of experiences, uh, potentially might not be useful for long recall periods, uh, or for questions that need very accurate responses. But the nice thing about surveys is that they, they can be combined with a variety of other methods. Uh, so you can supplement uh, a survey methodology to be able to get more in-depth data if you need that. Um, and so you can administer surveys uh, in a variety of ways. Your book covers these, so I'll cover them fairly quickly. Uh, so they, we can do them face-to-face, uh, -face, in person. Uh, there's obviously the potential there for social desirability uh, issues coming up in terms of answering the questions. Uh, but this can also be helpful if we need to um, make sure that our responses are accurate, if we need to make sure that the respondents understand the survey. Um, if there are literary, literacy issues, potentially this is um, a way around that but we do have to consider the, the potential for responses that are based on social desirability. Uh, telephone administered interviews are becoming more and more popular, um, and these can either be interviewer administered or automated. Uh, so in some cases, you'll get a phone call or you'll call into a system and it will ask you a variety of questions and you can use your touch screen uh, to be able to you know, put in numbers, uh, give a particular answer. Um, so these can be really great in terms of confidentiality or anonymity. Uh, and removing the, the individual who might be asking you those questions if you're doing an automated system. Uh, a lot of surveys are done via the internet now. So Qualtrics is a survey software, uh, similar in some ways to SurveyMonkey. Uh, Qualtrics is a little bit more um, involved and allows for more complex uh, skip patterns and some more complex functioning than SurveyMonkey does. Uh, with the internet, you have to always consider access. So is your population, is your sample going to have access to the internet? Um, and will uh, issues in um, differences in access to the internet change the nature of your sample at all? So if you're interested in having um, people who are lower in socioeconomic status who might not have access to the internet, um, is that going to be an issue for you? There's more and more research coming out that indicates that people across a range of socioeconomic uh, statuses or classes um, still have access to the internet. Having phones that have uh, access has made a huge difference. So when you're doing internet research, you always want to make sure that your surveys are optimized for mobile experiences as well as um, desktop experiences. Uh, paper and pen, these are brutal in terms of having to enter the data. Uh, they're subject to error in terms of data entry and also in terms of filling them out. Uh, so depending on uh, how legible handwriting is or how sloppy people are in circling or checking, 
uh, questions. Um, so it can be a little bit more subject to error uh, and the data entry process is, is brutal, particularly if you have a large sample. So I'll talk about, uh, I'll do a couple of slides just with some, some general design considerations for surveys. Um, you could do an entire class on survey design. So this is really very, a very quick look at some of these issues. Um, I think it's always good in surveys and more generally uh, to start end to end with uh, your appreciation for the people taking the time out of their lives to complete your research, to answer honestly, um, and give people clear information about what they're doing and why they're doing it. So what they're going to be doing in terms of the procedures of the study uh, and the potential value of the data that you're collecting. I think it's always nice to cover one topic at a time. It orients the person to what uh, they should be thinking about um, and it doesn't make them shift back and forth between different topics over the course of a survey. Using transitions, much like in your writing uh, in surveys, this is really helpful to let people know, okay, we're switching topics now. Now I want you to think about something different. This next set of questions will be asking you about this topic. Um, giving people instructions, clear instructions as to what they should think about and how they should answer the questions. Uh, making sure they understand that the, the response scale, uh, any time reference that they're using, um, and so giving clear instructions is key. Uh, I always think it's nice to start more generally and get more specific as you move through the survey. Um, and filtering and branching is a really key piece of survey design, uh, and this will make more sense for those of you if you're going to go on use SurveyMonkey. These are um, functions that you can do within some of the survey software that allows you to skip over questions that might not be relevant to people. And so, for example, if you ask people, um, how many sexual partners have you had in the last three months? And the answer is zero. You wouldn't go on to say, to ask them, of those zero partners, how many have you had sex with, uh, you know, without a condom or something like that? Um, you know that the answer is going to be zero because the original answer was zero. And so uh, you can make the process easier for that person if you can skip over those questions. And so being able to branch appropriately and to filter the survey appropriately uh, will make that experience better for your respondents. Um, I think in some cases uh, it can be appropriate to randomize the question and measure order. Um, obviously this can be uh, in contrast to what I said about doing one topic at a time, but within a topic area, if you want to randomize measure orders, uh, that can be appropriate, particularly if you think that answering a certain kind of question ahead of another kind of question might impact the way that people respond. I also think it's really worth it to make it user friendly. So uh, making the font big enough and easily readable, giving people a progress bar to let them know how far they are through the survey. Uh, anything that you can do to make the process easier for your respondents is huge. Uh, you also want to think about uh, sample considerations as you're designing your survey. So those will influence the decisions you make about how to administer that survey, the kinds of questions that you'll ask, the length of the survey, how the survey flows, instructions you give people. Um, and another thing that I think is really useful to think about is how long your survey is. Uh, and this is one of, this is an area in which I have really struggled because um, I get really excited about research and I want to ask them everything. Uh, and so, um, at the end of pretty much every survey I've ever designed, I've gotten the feedback of, wow, this was awful. Why did you make this so long? Do you hate me? Um, so uh, it's been a, a good lesson in my research life to think about trying to minimize the number of questions, uh, better use skip patterns, um, think about giving uh, response options that minimize the time that it takes to think about the answer to the questions, uh, obviously considering samples, um, and compensation as you think about the survey length. Uh, but a good golden rule is to do unto participants as you do unto yourself. Um, so if you wouldn't fill out a, an hour long survey for free, don't ask other people to fill out an hour long survey for free. And uh, I can't stress how important it is to think about piloting your survey and to think about marketing your survey in appropriate ways. Uh, in some of the research I've done, we've spent a ton of time thinking about designing a recruitment card or a logo. Um, because that first uh, glance at your study or at your survey may speak volumes to people and really influence uh, whether or not they take it at all, um, how they respond, what they think of you more generally. Um, so that, that I think that can be a really invaluable piece of the process. 
So um, correlational research, your, your book shifts to this topic, uh, and correlational research is something that we can definitely do in the context of survey research. Uh, I would say it's, it's very commonly uh, a way that we analyze survey data. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about correlations, and I think I have done a little conversation about correlations already, um, but correlations essentially describe relationships between two variables, associations between two variables. And so they allow us to see if two variables are moving in the same direction. And so we call something a negative correlation if what we see is that as one variable increases, the other one decreases. And we call something a positive correlation if both of the variables are moving in the same direction. So as one variable increases, the other one also increases, or as one variable decreases, the other one also decreases. And correlations will tell you the statistical significance of the association. Uh, so whether, and we'll talk about that more uh, in a couple of modules down the line, but um, this is essentially telling us whether or not the finding that we're seeing uh, is something that is real or that could have happened just by chance. Uh, correlations also indicate the direction of the association, so if it's a negative or a positive correlation. And uh, the correlations also indicate the magnitude of the association. So correlation values range from positive one to negative one, uh, and they tell you how big an association is. And we can also convert that by squaring it to an R-squared value, which indicates the proportion of variability in one variable that can be explained by the other variable. And we'll get into much more detail about this as we get into some of the quantitative analytic techniques uh, in a couple weeks. Essentially, correlations help make help us make predictions. Uh, often what we're trying to do in research is be able to predict behavior, to be able to better understand it in such a way that we can predict where people would fall on different scales, what, people, uh, what behavior people might engage in, and correlations help us to make those predictions. So we may ask a variety of questions that are correlational research questions. One of the big ones that you'll see in some of the online demos, if you look at some of the correlation demos, are uh, our SAT scores associated with college GPA. Um, there's typically a pretty strong and, uh, and kind of a clean association between these two variables, and this is often used as a demonstration of the idea of correlation. Uh, in our field, we can think about questions that are about sexuality. Uh, for example, is there an association between sexual satisfaction and relationship satisfaction? And so in this case, we probably would hypothesize that there is a positive correlation, such that as sexual satisfaction increases, relationship satisfaction also increases. Another question might be, is self-esteem associated with contraceptive self-efficacy, which means uh, the confidence that you have in your ability to use contraception, so the better you feel about yourself, uh, the more likely, the more confident you likely feel in your contraceptive abilities. So this would also be a situation in which we would hypothesize a positive correlation, such that as self-esteem increases, contraceptive self-efficacy would also increase. Uh, we may also ask if depression is associated with sexual satisfaction, and this would be a situation in which we probably would hypothesize a negative correlation. So as depression increases, sexual satisfaction decreases. And probably many of you have heard this phrase before. Uh, if not, I will say it many more times, I'm sure, over the rest of the semester. Correlation does not equal causation. So if we go back to these examples, uh, and we think about um, what a correlation would mean in these situations. So let's say in this second question, we find a correlation between sexual satisfaction and relationship satisfaction. But we can't necessarily say in this situation sexual satisfaction causes relationship satisfaction or that relationship satisfaction causes sexual satisfaction. Probably what we'll find in this particular situation is that there's a reciprocal association, um, but we can't ever conclude causation from correlational research. Um, if we're connecting a correlation in a situation that is a true experimental situation where we have randomized people to our groups, uh, where we have temporal priority of the independent variable, um, and where we can assure non-spuriousness, uh, then that would be a situation in which we might be able to use a correlation to assess a causal uh, hypothesis or question. Um, but for most of the research that we do using correlations, we're looking at uh, existing data or existing groupings, uh, which is where causal comparative research comes in. Um, this is a situation in which we may be analytically examining causal relationships 
among existing variables. Your book talks about um, groupings of people. So for example, uh, using race and ethnicity to think about uh, differences in some outcome measures, sexual risk behavior, uh, teen pregnancy outcomes, something like that. Um, and so we are thinking a little bit uh, about a causal association here. There's something about being of a particular race and ethnicity that uh, is associated with a particular set of outcomes. And so we are assuming some sort of causal relationship there, um, even though we didn't necessarily manipulate, and we obviously can't manipulate race and ethnicity. Um, and so there are certain things that we can't manipulate, like gender, like race and ethnicity. But we do often want to know about the effects of those variables, the predictive power of those variables on our outcome variables. Um, so we can use correlation for that, we can use other kinds of uh, group comparison methods that we'll talk about um, again in a bit, uh, a couple weeks. Um, so causal comparative research is not as strong as experimental research in being able to make causal claims, but it's often more practical or more ethical than conducting experimental research. So in the example I just gave, we obviously can't manipulate gender. We can't manipulate race and ethnicity. Um, and so practically, if we want to know about the effects of one of those variables on an outcome variable, we, um, we can't manipulate that. So we can't conduct an experiment in that situation. So causal comparative research is a way for us to be able to examine causal relationships uh, in situations in which we have not or maybe cannot conduct an experiment. So we can't make as strong of causal claims, but we certainly can think about causal relationships in this, uh, in this research. And so I'll end out talking about uh, evaluation research a bit. Um, evaluation research may be really useful for uh, a lot of you in terms of the kinds of work that you're going to go on and do, if you're going to end up in social service agencies or uh, working in sex ed capacities and thinking about the evaluation of your programs or your interventions. So in evaluation research, the end goal is often to determine uh, implementation, effectiveness, and efficiency of a program or an intervention, an education program, something like that. And we use those results to change the program or the intervention uh, to make decisions about whether or not we'll implement it in the future, uh, if we should implement it in particular kinds of groups or settings. Um, and the results are also used to understand how programs work. So um, even once we find that a program is effective, we may still want to know a little bit about how that was effective. Um, and so uh, having objectives at different levels, which your book talks about a little bit, um, can be really helpful in helping um, to understand why a particular intervention worked or how a particular intervention worked and understanding the mechanisms of that effect. Evaluation research can be experimental or non-experimental. Um, and in an objectives-oriented approach, which is what we typically are, have, are, are working from, um, process evaluations examine the implementation of the program. So it might be about fidelity of the protocol, uh, making adaptation necessary for success in that particular setting, et cetera. Um, and summative evaluations examine the final effects on program and outcomes. I'll break this down a little bit more. So in evaluation studies, uh, there can be a variety of focuses or foci that we are interested in. So um, if we conduct a needs assessment, which is often, as your book lays out, the first step of, um, of evaluation research. Um, so needs assessments help us understand what the needs are in that particular setting or population. Um, we also want to know about the potential for program evaluation. So can we even evaluate a program if we were to implement a program in this particular setting? Um, will people talk to us? Will the staff talk to us? Uh, are the, is it possible to collect this kind of data that we would need to evaluate the efficacy uh, or the implementation of the program? Uh, how does the program operate, so both in general and in this environment, so we could conduct a process evaluation to get a better sense of how the program was implemented. Um, and then we often think about these last couple of questions as kind of the, the main piece of evaluation research. So what is the program's impact or what are the magnitude of the effects? Um, and so that's a, a summative evaluation. Um, and how efficient is the program? So you'll often hear people talking about efficiency analyses, cost-benefit analyses, cost-effectiveness analyses. And this is getting a sense of uh, what are the benefits that we see? How much do those cost? How much are we saving uh, 
in getting these benefits, there are a whole variety of questions that go into understanding how efficient the program is. So even if we do see um, an impact uh, of some magnitude um, and indicate that this program is effective in some way, um, did it require us to move mountains to get that effect? Uh, and is that feasible moving forward? Um, so what's the cost benefit analysis there? And so your booklet has a, a really nice next section about laying out the goals and objectives. So I'll just touch on those really briefly. Uh, goals are these broad statements about the overarching conceptual aims of the program. Your book talks about these as what we sort of use as the face for people who maybe don't speak research language. Uh, maybe this is the PR component of this. Whereas objectives are specific statements that serve as the foundation of the program. So these objectives should directly relate to the program goals. Uh, they should facilitate measurement. So they should be specific enough that we can measure uh, and determine if we have met those objectives. Um, they should be written at multiple levels so we can think about program uh, objectives, behavioral objectives, learning objectives of a variety of kinds, uh, environmental objectives, informative objectives. Um, and so I won't say a ton more about program evaluation. Your book talks about that uh, a bit more, and um, we'll spend a little bit more time thinking about program evaluation when we do the module uh, that is about um, translating research. So that's module 13 in terms of translating research into practice. We can think a little bit about uh, evaluation, um, program evaluation in that module as well. So. I will end there. Uh, the quiz that is due in this module is now posted on Campus Cruiser. It's available as of the morning of 1026. Um, once you've begun, you'll have an hour to answer 15 multiple choice and true false questions. You can obviously use your books and your, your book and your notes. Um, but I would just try and organize myself a little bit uh, because once you start, you'll only have an hour to finish. And so you want to make sure that you're organized, you're ready to go, uh, and you can sit down and devote that hour um, to being able to answer those questions. So as always, let me know if you have questions, thoughts, concerns, etc. And I will see you next time.